Hello everybody, Scott Gossenberger, and we're uh, in part two of our series, True North. Uh, today we're looking at the magnetic pull of control, and uh, there's a saying that says you can't control the wind, but you can control your sails. And this is what I love about sailing is, is that you're actually kind of driven by the wind. You can affect the course by how you set your sails, and uh, sometimes you have to tack back and forth in order to get to the destination that you're supposed to be at it. It does sort of set me out of control and puts the wind in control. Now, I've been a power boater most of my life and there's something great about that because you just set the engine and you head where you need to go and it's more efficient and more direct, but uh, it's actually less creative and ultimately uh, probably not as fun. I, I, I remember when Jason was a, a little guy, when he, he had just learned to talk not too long prior to this and we would put him in the car, we'd be on road trips and he would say this same phrase over and over and probably a hundred times. Uh, he would talk a lot and then he would always ask, what's that, what's that? He always wanted to know what something was and uh, when the answer was, I don't know, he got, would get really frustrated because he wanted to know what the reason was, what the answer was, what the, the point is. And um, it wasn't long after that, I remember we went to Carl's Jr and they were given away in their, not like a happy meal, I don't remember what it was, but it was a kid's meal, and they were given away a CD that uh, actually gave information about animals, and we'd listen to that CD over and over and over again because it would talk about the animals, and I remember talked about the rhinoceros and that its horns were actually pressed hair together. I mean, good information, it was kind of fun. Um, but he wanted to listen to that over and over again because he wanted answers, loved animals and wanted answers. And ultimately, uh, what Jason was as a little guy is what I am and what many of us are as adults. We just want to be in control. We want to know all the reasons why. And if we can know the reasons why, well, then it puts us in control. The other day, Melvin asked me, he says, hey, would you ever want to go parasailing? And I said, no, and then I thought about it. I said, the reason why I don't is because I have no control over that. I don't mind being on a jet ski as long as I'm driving. I don't mind being on a motorcycle as long as I'm driving. I like uh, an element of control, and when someone else is in control, I don't know, it makes me nervous. And so today, as we look at uh, John chapter nine, verses one through 12, this is actually, um, where Jesus is showing us that we're not in control, that God is sovereign and God is ultimately in control. So let's look uh, at the scripture. We'll read it all the way through and then we'll go back and uh, see what God might be saying to us about uh, control and how we can overcome it. It says, as long uh, as he went along, he saw a man blind from birth. His disciples asked him, Rabbi, who sinned? This man or his parents that he was born blind? Neither this man nor his parents sinned, said Jesus, but this happened so that the work of God might be displayed in him. As long as it is day, we must do the works of him who sent me. Night is coming when no one can work. While I'm in the world, I am the light of the world. After saying this, he spit on the ground, made some mud with the saliva, put it on the man's eyes, Go, he told him, wash in the pool of Siloam. This word means sent. So the man went and washed and came home seeing. His neighbors and those who had formerly seen him begging asked, isn't this the same man who used to sit and beg? Some claimed that he was. Others said, no, he only looks like him. His twin brother or something, I guess, uh, his doppelganger. Um, how then were, uh, but he, and so, he himself insisted, I am the man. How then were your eyes open, they asked. He replied, the man they called Jesus made some mud, put it on my eyes. He told me to go to Siloam and wash. So I went and washed and then I could see. Where is this man, they asked him. I don't know, he said. So, and then there's some controversy that comes up and we'll walk through that next week. Um, but. The, the scripture is interesting. He's saying that, you know, he's saying that that something happened, this blind man saying something happened. I know it was Jesus, but I don't really know all the reasons why. I don't know the, what's that, what's that? 
like Jason said when he was a little kid. Um, so how do we how do we do this? How do we let go of of our need for control and find freedom? There's a scripture Paul writes to the Galatians in chapter five, verse one. He says, "It was for freedom that Christ has set us free. Stand firm, then, and do not let yourselves be." burdened again by the yoke of slavery. What was the yoke of slavery? For them, it was the law. It was this religious prescription. It was, uh, if you do certain things, then there's a certain guarantees that God will like you or God will perform for you or uh, you'll be in God's good graces or you'll go to heaven or whatever, right? And so what Paul is saying is, don't let go of your freedom. You've been given freedom. Don't let go of that freedom for the sake of control of trying to control it yourself. The law was really, it was not external, uh, it was not um, God's control, it was actually my ability internally or by my actions and behavior externally to control the outcomes of my life. Now I want you to know, this is something that I struggle with. I struggle with the need for control. I don't like being out of control. And yet, I've done something uh, and you've done it with me, if you're a part of Rock Harbor. Uh, we're doing something together that is completely beyond our control. Uh, we're praying that God would help us build a church that only God can build, which means that we're gonna pray, we're gonna seek God, we're gonna invite our friends, we're gonna do what we can do, but the results, the blessing, the, uh, the, the fullness of the Spirit really comes down to God and what He wants to do. So here's uh, their first fill-in. If you're taking notes, uh, I'm gonna give you, uh, as we walk along, we give you three things not to do and we just stop doing. And then along with them, three things to either continue to do or start doing. So here's the first. Uh, if I'm gonna let go of control, this magnetic pull uh, away from what God wants me to do, uh, here's what I, I am gonna do. I'm gonna let go of my need to find fault to make my future more predictable. I'm going, to, uh, I'm going to let go of my need to find fault, be a fault finder, to make my future more predictable. Here's what the disciples asked, and uh, it was an honest question at that time. They said, who sinned? Uh, the culture at that time, the religious culture at that time was, God is good, and therefore since God is good, he only does good things to people who are, are, you know, are righteous. If you do good, you get good. If you do bad, you get bad. And so their natural inclination was to say, something bad happened, uh, some sin must have happened either by the man. Now, he was blind from birth. How could he have sinned? Well, there was an understanding or uh, some people believed at that time that you were preexistent uh, and then that when you were born, your preexistent soul kind of was placed into your into your body and so there there's this they were I guess had this understanding or belief that maybe in, as a pre-existent soul he had committed some kind of sin and then uh, there there was this idea that wow we got a siren going on behind us and I don't think you can hear me at all so uh, they this is part of doing live uh, in, out in public uh, you know, sermons, you never know what's going to happen. I'm not in control of that. Dang it. So um, here's what they were asking is, did the man uh, sin pre-existent to his birth or did his parents sin? And this was their punishment and they had to watch their son suffer for his whole life. They, the problem with that is, I mean, it makes sense for us. I mean, it, it's like, okay, well, to, you know, God does good things to good people and he does evil things to evil people, or maybe not evil things, but bad things to people who are evil. The question revealed this. It, uh, we gotta establish fault because if we can find the fault, then it sort of protects me from worrying about any kind of bad thing happening to me. I can control my circumstances by making sure that I do, well, the right thing. So as long as I do good, Am I, I am a good person, whatever that means, then I can expect good things to happen to me. It's, it's my way of, well, I guess, guaranteeing that my future is going to be good. Jesus' answer is confusing to them though. Because he says, well, neither he sinned nor, nor his parents. But 
but this happened so that God would be glorified in him. Hey, here's my the natural question that came out for me anyhow when I was reading through this is would I have chosen, would I choose blindness for all those years in order to experience the glory of God? And my answer is no, I don't think I would. As much as I want God's glory uh, to be evidenced in my life and would like to you know, have some kind of great miracle like that, I think I'd choose to see for however many years he was blind. So this man didn't choose it. His parents didn't choose it. What Jesus says is that God chose it. God chose it so that this moment would happen in his life that accomplished two great things. First of all, he experienced a great miracle and was able to see things that he was only told about for many, many years. Secondly, we, you have to believe, this set him towards believing that Jesus was the Messiah so that it was not just glorification in this life, but he found the glory of God in eternal life. You know what I do? I, I, I like to place blame, maybe you do the same, so that it deflects the possibility of hardship later on. Here's what I used to do a lot. I'm trying to get better at it, but I would come home and there'd be dirty dishes in the sink or on the counter, wrappers left places, and I would go start you know, asking, who did this? Who left the dishes in the sink and who did that? Here's why I did that, because if I could find the person to blame, I could make them accountable and then maybe this wouldn't happen anymore and I'd be happier. Do you ever do that? And it's natural, it's not necessarily all bad, right? We need to hold people accountable, especially our kids, especially when they're adult kids. We need to hold them accountable. Um, but the, there is this other side of it that I wanted to control the future outcomes. I know this seems silly, but we all do this, right? We do this in other ways, like we do this as adults where if uh, the economy is going south, uh, things are going bad economically, and our candidate or our political party isn't in power, we can blame the opposing candidate, the opposing can, can, uh, uh, party because it's their fault and that's why these bad things are happening. And if only my candidate or my, par my party got in power, then there would be some kind of control that would happen over the economy. Or, well, I don't know, what about poor decisions by yourself or maybe poor decisions by others? And you say, well, the reason why they got sick or the reason why this happened is because they had some fault or there's some blame I can place on them. And what that does is it protects me. So long as I don't do those things, it protects me from, well, negative outcomes. Well, and here's the truth of the matter is, it's always the mom's fault, isn't it? It's always, I mean, you had some bad family upbringing and your mom was, you know, mean to you. And so it justifies all these bad behaviors or whatever. That's simply not true, right? We, we get that. And yet that's so much a part of our culture. Even this, even the response to the whole COVID-19, which has been going on forever, it seems like. Um, what we've done is we've turned people into fault finders. Uh, they, they find somebody who got them sick or got somebody else sick and now it's their fault. That's never happened uh, in my lifetime anyhow, where we start placing blame on other people for the sickness that we, we got. And so we wear masks or double mask or, and none of that necessarily is bad. It's not a bad thing. It's just somehow we've decided that if we can control, we can tr control things, we will live longer, we'll be protected. And the truth of the matter is, no matter what we do, God is ultimately sovereign and in control. So what do we do? What's the positive thing to do? Here's what, what, I'm, what I'm trying to choose to do. I look where God is at work in all my circumstances. Where is God at work in all my circumstances? Romans chapter eight, verse 28 says, and we know that in all things, God works for the good, for those who love him, who have been called according to his purposes. What the disciples were called to do by Jesus is to say, not whose fault is it, but what does God want to do in it? Instead of looking for fault, we look for reasons why, uh, or, or, or why God, uh, what God wants us to do. So something bad happens. We can try and look for fault, or we can say, God's at work, God allowed this. 
So where is God at work in the midst of this circumstance? Here's the second thing I see that I need to stop doing if I'm going to experience a true north. Instead of finding fault or wanting to be in control, finding true north rather than magnetic north, and is this, I don't expect a cure by applying a religious prescription. I don't expect a cure by applying a religious prescription. Notice what Jesus does. He, and I think we in our, our day and age think this is weird. I mean, I think it's weird. I'm not gonna go around spitting in the mud and putting uh, mud on people's eyes, hoping that they he, uh, get healed of blindness or, or whatever it might be. If they have a bad shoulder, I'm not gonna spit it in the ground and rub some mud on their shoulder. Uh, it seems weird to us. It really actually wasn't weird at that time. There was a belief that a prophet, a holy person, uh, that their spit or their saliva was actually had some curative properties that had some healing properties and so um, we actually see Jesus doing this at two other occasions one uh, in Mark chapter 7 a man was deaf he put his fingers in the man's ears that's weird too put his fingers in the man's ear and then takes some uh, dips his his finger on his own tongue in his saliva and then touches the tongue of the deaf man in order to give him the ability to speak. And uh, there's another time where Jesus spits in a, a man's eyes and he recovers his sight. However, there are many other times where Jesus does a miracle or does healing and there is none, none of that happens. He just speaks it, uh, just commands it and things happen. And uh, I, I think the reason why Jesus did it differently was for, I think in one sense to illustrate something by what he was doing, but secondly, so that we wouldn't come up with a prescription on how we're supposed to do things all the time. Jesus did things differently all the time so that we wouldn't make a, I guess, a, a religious right out of certain things that Jesus did. It's so easy to do, right? It's so easy to say, if we just do it this way, then, you know, then God's gonna, you know, God's gonna always come through that particular way. It's like saying, in Jesus name well, there's nothing wrong with that but there's nothing magical at the end of your prayer to say in Jesus name we say that to say we're we're giving Jesus authority over this we're praying this because this is something Jesus would want we're not doing it because if we say it that Jesus comes through I guess um, when I was in pharmaceuticals I remember talking to doctors and uh, I when I worked for Pfizer we actually sold Zithromax and um, what we are in, trying to encourage doctors to do is not over prescribe so that it would stay well, effective longer uh, and doctors would say this they would say when someone comes to my office and they're struggling with a cold or a flu they expect a prescription and if they don't get a prescription if you just tell them hey go home this will you know this will pass they feel like I didn't do my job so oftentimes the doctors felt pressure to give a prescription so that the patient felt like they were actually being benefited or helped. But my copay went for a good, you know, a good cause or whatever. And, and I think we do that sometimes in our faith is we, we want to apply a prescription. If I get a prescription, then God gives some kind of results. I heard a, a story about a man who, um, who actually went to the doctor because every time he drank hot chocolate, he got pain in his eye. So he went to the doctor and he said, hey, doctor, I need you to come up with a solution. I love hot chocolate, but every time I drink hot chocolate, I get a pain in my eye and I, I don't know what's going on. Can you give me a pill? Is there some kind of, some kind of you know, uh, surgery or anything that you can do for me? Because I want to keep drinking hot chocolate, but don't like the pain in my eye. Well, the doctor thought about it and thought, well, this is really unusual. I've never heard of this before. He says, tell you what, uh, let's get some hot chocolate from the break room and you show me how you drink it. And so the man got the powder, the hot water, put it all together, stirred it uh, with the spoon and then drank it and says, ow, see, I'm getting a pain in my eye. And the doctor says, huh, I've got the answer for you. He said, well, what are you gonna do? Is there a surgery? Is there some kind of pill for this? He says, no, you just need to take the spoon out of the cup. Sometimes, you know, sometimes what we want is we want a prescription. And sometimes the answer is just to stop doing, you know, things that we do. So here's, uh, well, here's the thing. Faith isn't meant to be, well, it's, it, it's not meant to be an application of a ritual. 
Faith instead is meant to be a built uh, a building of a relationship that is built on trust. So uh, I guess if I pray for God to give us a safe trip and take away uh, any chance of a breakdown, it doesn't guarantee that I'm not going to break down. It just means I'm giving God the trip and I'm trusting him that whatever happens is happening under his leadership. If I give a thousand dollars to the church, it doesn't mean that I can expect ten thousand dollars in my bank account right after that. It simply means I'm going to be obedient and trust God for it. Here's, here's the thing to start doing. I decide to help others heal and trust God for my healing. So I, I just do the right thing, right? I, it's not a prescription. I do what God's called me to do. I, I, I help other people heal, I help people, other people find the cure that is found in Jesus Christ and trust that he's gonna heal me in the process. Jesus says in uh, the scripture that we read in verse five, he said that he's the light of the world. In Matthew chapter five, verse 14, Jesus said this, he said, you are the light of the world. A town built on a hill cannot be hidden. If I try to control everything, what I'm trying to control is my circumstances. And I just can't do that. What, uh, what it comes down to is instead of trying to control my environment, my circumstances, I simply need to invest in other people. I need to be the light so that the light of Jesus can continue to flow in and through me. And here's the last uh, thing to stop doing and then we'll give you one last thing to start doing. I don't expect the, an outcome, I don't expect an outcome as a reward for my obedience. I don't expect an outcome as a reward for my obedience. Notice what Jesus does and it's just uh, kind of curious. Um, what Jesus says is he, he you know, puts mud on his eyes and then he sends him on his own. There's no indication that Jesus goes with him or any of the disciples go with him. Jesus says, I know you're blind. I put mud on your eye. Go to the pool of Siloam and wash there. He doesn't say what, uh, what Jesus leaves out is actually makes it even more interesting. He doesn't tell the man, go wash and then you'll receive your sight. He doesn't say, go wash and everything's gonna be work, uh, gonna work out. And he doesn't even go with him, which I think is fascinating. So I'm thinking about this man, he's got mud on his eyes and uh, he bumps along, stumbling in the process. Maybe he tripped on the way there. Um, certainly he bumped into things or people uh, in the whole process. God gave him, Jesus gave him a command with no guarantee and he didn't even help him get there without stumbling there were all kind of roadblocks and all kind of stumblings and he bumped into all kinds of things it was not a smooth easy transition or journey to the pool of siloam he goes there and they throw in this word scent uh, which we'll talk about here in a moment he stumbled and went to the pool of siloam which means sent. In other words, he went where he was sent. And that I think is significant. Sometimes we're told the outcomes. Sometimes we're told, hey, this is, you know, you do this and there's these great things or whatever. There's these expectations you can have. But most of the time, God just calls us to be faithful and obedient. Jesus says, do these things, follow me, trust me, and I will be with you. So, when I think about that, I think that it comes down to this, that if we love for the sake of an outcome, well, that love really is kind of selfish. I, I would tell you this, I don't know, maybe you're in a relationship that is difficult or challenging, and you think, well, I'll love or I'll do what God wants me to do, but I want to guarantee that this marriage or this relationship is going to be positive or healthy or going to become productive or beneficial for me or I'll enjoy it. No, that's not what he says. He says, love, go to the pool of Siloam. Go where I send you, go where I ask you to do, and trust me that in the midst of it all, even if it all doesn't turn out perfectly, it's going to be my best for you. Or, well, you know, you, you want things to be great, so you take a particular job and and you feel God leading in it, and you're kind of hoping that it's gonna mean great success, 
or great value or you're going to get a raise or whatever. And God doesn't say, I'm not promising you, promising you success. I'm not promising you abundance. I'm saying that you do what I ask you to do. And trust me that if I send you, that the end result will be good. I remember a couple um, years ago when I was at People's Church and they were trying to do everything good. Uh, they abstained from any kind of romantic, I mean, they didn't even kiss until their, their wedding day. And they were trying to do all the right things, make sure all the right things took place. They were gonna do all the right things because that would guarantee success as a couple. They had a, a marriage where they had children and they still ended up, unfortunately, getting a divorce. And it, through that, they, there was some disillusionment. We did all the right things. We, we made all the right choices and yet still, there was a brokenness in our marriage. There was a brokenness in our relationship. There was something that wasn't right. See, there's not a guarantee if you do all the right things that this marital bliss happens or that you don't go into difficulty or that everything turns out beautifully. Sometimes, sometimes even in our obedience, God's, God allows difficulty. So here's the thing to do. I will go wherever Jesus sends me. That's why that the, John writes in there that Siloam means sent. He's saying that, that there's no guarantee that there's going to be a great thing on the other side. Now for this man, he went, he was obedient, washed his eyes, and he could see. But that's not always the case. Sometimes we go and we wash and we still struggle and there's still difficulty. But we go and we do what God's called us to do because, well, he's sending us. There's a whole book in the Old Testament that speaks to this, Hosea. He was a prophet, and uh, God called him as a prophet to re-engage with his wife who left him for other men. She became a prostitute, and God says, instead of divorcing her, instead of abandoning her, I want you to, I want you to remarry her, to re-engage with her. And God didn't promise him that if he did this, that they would have this happy, blissful marriage. He just said, I want you to do this, the right thing. Uh, it's what I'm calling you to do. It's the, the step of obedience. It's walking to the pool of Siloam for you. And so he does. And then after he remarries her and re-engages with her, God speaks through that relationship of what he wants to do through uh, unfaithful Israel. Israel had become unfaithful and God said that in their unfaithfulness, I'm going to re-engage with them and they are going to return to me and there will be a reuniting of our relationship. So that, that broken marriage and that difficulty that Hosea chose to go through out of obedience actually became a testimony or a proclamation of God's intention to the whole nation of Israel. So it is for all of us. I want to control things, you probably want to control things. But God ultimately says, I'm going to be in control. And if you trust me, I will take care of you. If you trust me, I will speak through you. If you trust me, I will lead you. And yes, most of the time it's to great bliss. It's to great things. It's to an abundant life. That that abundance may not be the way we think it should be. Let go of the control. It was for freedom that Christ set you free. Therefore, don't be subject again to the yoke of slavery, which is control. Our own control feels like freedom, but it absolutely isn't. The greatest freedom is trusting God. He has his best plan for you. God bless you. Have a great day in the Lord.